Hi, welcome. This is the Chapter 5 Review, Part 2, and we're continuing looking at cell structures. In this first slide, we see a picture of a prokaryotic cell. And remember, um, they're considered a simpler form of cells, but that doesn't mean that they don't have unique features. So if we look at this cell, there's some basic features we learned about before. There's cytoplasm, of course, there's a plasma membrane, there's genetic material. It has to have genes to pass on information but it's just not inside of a nucleus. So if you have genes and genes encode information to make proteins, that means you need structures to make proteins. And these structures are called ribosomes. So the prokaryotes do have ribosomes as well. The, the structures here with the red arrows indicate additional features that not all of the prokaryotes have to have. So there's a plasma membrane, that's the barrier, but it, outside the plasma membrane, there can be a cell wall made of peptidoglycan uh, and it's, sometimes it can have an outer membrane as well, so an inner plasma membrane, and then a secondary outer plasma membrane. And then some have a capsule. Right? An additional one here is a flagellum. Not all bacteria have a flagellum, but they may or may not. So these features, capsule, cell wall, outer plasma membrane, flagella, they are found in some bacteria, they're not found in other ones, and it helps classify them based on these structures. Okay, any of these features outside the plasma membrane, like a cell wall and a capsule, aid in providing additional protection um, from, for these bacteria and more rigid support. Here's a eukaryotic cell. So when you look at this, of course, you can see it's a lot more complex. The biggest thing you notice is a nucleus in the center and all of these membrane compartments inside. And these are the organelles. We're going to learn about them in a little more detail. So briefly, if we look at some of these, the center one here is called the nucleus, right, the nucleus. The nucleus has a dense region inside called the nucleolus. This is a dark staining region on this micrograph. This is where ribosomes begin to be manufactured out of, um, nope, out of rRNA, rRNA. And then out, the nucleus has its own membrane called the um, nuclear envelope, okay? And it's continuous with this next structure called the endoplasmic reticulum. The nuclear envelope has pores in it, nuclear pores. That's important because we have information inside the cell to make proteins, and that information has to come outside of the cells where the ribosomes are, where proteins are actually made. Okay, the next couple of um, compartments, we have the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We have a Golgi and a plasma membrane. All of these we'll talk about together because they're part of the endomembrane system. Then we have ribosomes, which are all these granules, these small little dots. Some of them are in the cytoplasm. Some of them are attached to the rough ER. That's what makes it rough looking. Then we have the mitochondria for energy production. And then we have um, cytoskeleton, this network of rigid proteins that provide support inside of the cell. So briefly, if we look at the, the rough ER, okay, what this does is it helps this is a site where many new proteins are synthesized. So there's ribosomes attached to it. That's what makes it rough. And as these proteins are synthesized, they're inserted inside of the RER. Inside the rough ER, they can be further modified. They can have carbohydrates added to them. This makes glycoproteins. Glyco means sugar and protein. They're then concentrated and shipped. Okay. If you look here, we have a smooth ER. This is in the endoplasmic reticulum without ribosomes. Okay. This is a site of uh, additional modifications to proteins. Um, that come from the rough ER. So they get further modified and packaged for shipment. It's also the site of metabolism or uh, detoxification of drugs and chemicals from the environment. The smooth ER is also where um, glycogen is deg degraded in animal cells, glycogen being the storage polysaccharide that we learned about previously. Okay, the next uh, is the Golgi. This is a site that receives information proteins packaged from the ER, it further modifies them and concentrates them and sorts them. So we'll learn about these here in a second. So this slide here, we're talking about the endomembrane system. Okay, the endomembrane system is a interconnected system of membrane enclosed compartments. Endo means inside of, membrane means membrane bound. And so if we look at this list, one through five here, these are all the parts of the endomembrane system. They're either physically connected their membranes or they're um, indirectly connected through vesicles, small little 
a spheres, membrane-bound compartments that travel from one of these spots to the next. So we start at the nuclear envelope and we move down this path towards the plasma membrane, and this is the endomembrane system. So the first stop is the nucleus, or the nuclear envelope, and then we have the RER, the smooth ER, the Golgi, we have transport vesicles and lysosomes and the plasma membrane. So let's look at a picture of this. So here's the endomembrane system. Okay, so this is the how proteins are synthesized, packaged for transportation throughout the cell or for excretion out of the cell. Okay, so here we have the nucleus and it's continuous. The nuclear envelope is actually continuous with the rough ER, the next stop of the endomembrane system. So here's the nuclear envelope being continuous with the RER. So this is a rough endoplasmic reticulum because there's ribosomes attached to it. See these dots? Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. So as proteins are synthesized at the RER, they're injected inside of the RER, and they're modified. They can be, they're folded up, they're modified, they have carbohydrates attached, then they're packaged into vesicles. From the rough ER, they travel via these vesicles to the Golgi. All right, so here we see the Golgi collecting vesicles from the rough ER. These vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane of the Golgi, and the contents are in injected inside of the Golgi. So inside the Golgi, those proteins can be further modified, further concentrated, further packaged, and from here they can move out of the cell. Okay, so these little vesicles then travel from the Golgi to the next stop of the endomembrane system, the plasma membrane. There they fuse and they release proteins outside the cell for secretion. These could be chemical signals uh, or other proteins, enzymes that they're releasing into the environment. These vesicles could go somewhere else inside of the cell. They don't have to go to the plasma membrane. They may have another destination, okay? A, small, a subset of these vesicles actually form what we call lysosomes, which have digestive enzymes inside of it for phagocytosis. So this is the endomembrane system. It's really important to remember it's a series of membrane-connected um, structures. They're either physically connected or connected via vesicles, and the information actually flows in this material from the nuclear envelope, the rough ER, then to the Golgi, then to the plasma membrane or somewhere else inside of the cell. So lysosomes are important because they're a special type of vesicle that has enzymes inside of them. Remember, enzymes are proteins, and these ones are used for digestion of material. So phagocytosis is the process of a cell eating material from its environment. So what happens is the cell's plasma membrane actually encloses some debris or food from the environment and forms a vesicle called a phagosome. Okay, so that's the food material inside of the phagosome. It fuses with a lysosome that has digestive enzymes. Remember that term lyse means to break? So these enzymes break down food. So when the lysosome and the phagosome fuse, the material is digested. Okay, so this could release food for the cell to use to create energy. Um, this could be an example would be a macrophage or other cells of our immune system. They actually eat foreign invaders like pathogens, bacteria, and kill them this way. Um, also, cellular structures inside the cell get worn out. They get old, they break down, and so the cell recycles them by actually digesting them and then releasing that material to recycle it. Okay, the next um, structures we'll focus on are organelles that produce energy, and there's two main ones, the mitochondria, in the chloroplasts. So the first one we'll look at the mitochondria. What this does is it takes chemical energy from food, things like sugar, we'll learn about glucose specifically, and it transforms it into energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is something we're going to learn a lot about in the subsequent chapters. This process is called cellular respiration and occurs at the mitochondria. Are, and partially, the main production of ATP occurs inside the mitochondria. If we look at the mitochondria, it has very unique shapes. Remember, structure and function are so important. So the mitochondria has two membranes, an inner, outer membrane and an inner membrane. Its inner membrane has all these folds on it called cristae. These are important because they increase the surface area. Inside this, on these folds is where the actual ATP is produced. So if you have lots of folds, lots of surface, you can make lots of ATP. Now the actual region inside the inner membrane is called the mitochondrial matrix. And what's interesting about mitochondria is they actually have their own DNA. They have their own genome. They also have their own ribosomes. Um, so this helps us to understand that mitochondria 
originated at one point as free living bacteria because they look a lot like some of a common bacteria. They have two membranes, they have their own DNA. Their DNA actually looks like prokaryotic DNA, okay, and their ribosomes look like prokaryotic ribosomes. The other energy organelle um, belong to a class called plastids, and these are found in plants and they perform photosynthesis. And so they're not in animal cells, like our cells, for instance, um, but they're the site of photosynthesis. So they're green, they have chloroplasts. These are the chloroplasts or photosynthesis occurs here. So let's take a look at one of these chloroplasts in more detail. Um, some structures to be familiar with. Inside we have these membranes called thylakoids that are stacked in discs called the granum. Okay, and this is the site of some important steps in photosynthesis we'll learn about in chapter 10. Um, so the chlorophyll is actually within here. This is the pigment that absorbs sunlight. The fluid, there's a fluid inside here called stroma. Okay, and that's the fluid portion inside of the chloroplast. So those are the two main energy producing organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Now, I mentioned plants have chloroplasts, but they also have mitochondria. Okay, so it's, um, the interconnection between these two we'll learn about in chapter 10 when we look at photosynthesis. The last component I want to talk about is the cytoskeleton. So our cells have an internal rigid support system to help give them structure and support. It's called the cytoskeleton. It's important for support. It helps position organelles. And it's also related to movement of the cell itself and also movement of stuff within the cell. There's three major components to this cytoskeleton. There's microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. So if you look at this section of a cell in this picture, you see all this network inside. So it's not just cytoplasm and organelles. There's an internal framework that is the cytoskeleton. What I want you to know about these, there's a table we'll fill out, but I want you to know the basic size. I want you to know what they're made out of, and I want you to know what they function as. So you see the filament, microfilaments, the smallest, Microtubules are the largest. If you think tubes are big, filaments are small. And then in between, there's intermediate filaments. So it kind of makes sense. So here's a table. You might, you might pause the video and look at this table and try to fill it out to study, or you can get it from our notes in class. But let's look at microfilaments first. They're the smallest of the cytoskeleton components. They're made out of a protein called actin, and they're related to support movement. Uh, the example we learned about in class are pseudopodia, these the movement of the plasma membrane, and then the cell contracts and pulls itself forward. Pseudopodium means false foot. And then also these microvilli, these small extensions from some cells, okay, are, are extensions of the cytoplasm in these small filaments, um, and the microfilaments facilitate those formations. Intermediate filaments, they're the intermediate sized cytoskeleton components. These are made out of a protein called keratin, and they provide support Okay, that's what the skeleton does. So they all provide some levels of support. They also are related to uh, um, providing a more rigid support to the structures like the microvilli we saw. So the, the microfilaments that extend the microvilli then come in and anchor to intermediate filaments within inside the cell. The microtubules are the largest. They're made out of a protein called tubulin, so that's easy to remember. They provide a very strong support. Okay, they provide a network inside of the cell for things to move around on. They're also related to the formation of cilia and flagella, and I would have you reference your notes in class to look at the structures of the cilia and flagella, specifically how the microtubules form them. Um, they're also related to motor proteins that move things along these microtubules. So these tubules form a highway essentially inside the cells, and motor proteins can take vesicles and move it along. The microtubules we'll also see later are related to cell division. Okay, and lastly, we'll just mention these um, motor proteins. These are called dynin and kinesin, and they help with the movement, and they're related to microtubules. So here we see dynin is a protein that connects two of the microtubules in this cilia. And it, as it moves, this dynin is a dynamic molecule. It causes these microtubules to move, and when they both move back and forth, it causes the cilium to sway back and forth. Okay. Then kinesin is a motor protein that actually walks along microtubules inside the cell, carrying transport vesicles with it. So it helps things actually get along inside of the cell, and it requires energy. So you can think dynin is dynamic, so it's movement. Kinesin is kinetic, which also is related to movement. 
So those are the basic structures of the cell in our review of chapter five.